breakfast was over, we retired to the after cabin, countless closets, and said, the emperor is so anxious to spare the further effusion of human blood that he will proceed to America in any way the British government chooses to sanction, either in a French ship of war, vessel armed, on fluke, a merchant vessel, or even in a British ship of war. To this I answered, I have no authority to agree to any arrangement of that sort, nor do I believe my government would consent to it, but I think I may venture to receive him in this ship and convey him to England. If, however, I added, he adopts that plan, I cannot enter into any promise as to the reception he may meet with. As, even in the case I have mentioned, I shall be acting on my own responsibility and cannot be sure that it would meet with the approbation of the British government. There was a great deal of conversation on this subject, in the course of which Lucian Bonaparte's name was mentioned and the manner to which he had lived in England alluded to, but I invariably assured Las Casas most explicitly that I had no authority to make any conditions of any sort as to Napoleon's reception in England. In fact, I could not have done otherwise since, with the exception of the order inserted at page 25, I had no instruction for my guidance, and was, of course, in total ignorance of the intention of His Majesty's ministers as to his future disposal. One of the last observations Las Casas made before quitting the ship was, under all circumstances, I have little doubt that you will see the emperor on board the Balrofen. And in fact, Bonaparte must have determined on that step before Las Casas came on board, as his letter to His Royal Highness the Prince Regent is dated the 13th of July, the day before this conversation. During the above mentioned conversation, I asked Las Casas where Bonaparte then was. He replied at Beauchefort. I left him there yesterday evening. General Lallemand then said, the emperor lives at the hotel in the Grand Place and is now so popular there that the inhabitants assemble every evening in front of the house for the purpose of seeing him and crying, Viva l'Empereur. I then asked how long it would take to go there. Los Casas answered, as the tide will be against us, it will require five or six hours. Why these false statements were made, I cannot pretend to say, but it is very certain that Bonaparte never quitted the frigates or Isle d'Aix after his arrival there on the 3rd of July. General Alamon took occasion to ask me if I thought there would be any risk to the people who might accompany Bonaparte being given up to the government of France? I replied, certainly not. The British government could never think of doing so under the circumstances contemplated in the present arrangement. They left me about a half past 9 a.m. In the course of the day, I was joined by the Bermudan Captain Gambier, who had been sent to me by Captain Green of the Daphne with a letter he had received from Captain Aylmer of the Pactolus in the Gironda, bringing information that it was the intention of Bonaparte to escape from Rochefort in a Danish sloop, concealed in a cask, stowed in a ballast, with tubes so constructed as to convey air for his breathing. I afterwards inquired of General Savary if there had been any foundation for such a report. When he informed me that the plan had been thought of, and the vessel in some measure prepared, but it was considered too hazardous. For had we detained the vessel for a day or two, he would have been obliged to make his situation known and thereby forfeited all claims to the good treatment he hoped to ensure by voluntary surrender. The two captains dined with me and afterwards went on board the Myrmidon to take up a position in the northeast of the Balrofen to prevent vessels from passing close in shore, thus to render the blockade of the port more complete. Soon after they left me, a barge was perceived rowing off from the frigates towards the Belrefin with a flag of truce up, on which I recalled Captain Sartorius and Gabier by signal that they might be present at any communication that was to be made. The boat got along about 7 p.m. and brought countless causes, accompanied by General Baron Gargoyle, one of Bonaparte's camp, on their coming on deck. I immediately addressed Las Casas, saying, it is impossible you could have been at Rochefort and returned since you left me this morning. He replied, no, it was not necessary. I found the emperor at the Isle d'Aix on my arrival there. He then told me he was charged with a letter from General Bertrand. We walked into the cabin when he delivered it to me. It was as follows. The 14 juillet, 1815. Ah, oh, it's French. All right. Translation. Sir, 
Countless causes has reported to the Emperor the conversation which he had with you this morning. His Majesty will proceed on board your ship with the ebb tide tomorrow morning between 4 and 5 o'clock. I send the countless causes, Council of State, doing the duty of Marechal de Loge with the list of persons composing His Majesty's suite. If the Admiral, in consequence of the dispatch you forwarded to him, should send the passport for the United States therein demanded, His Majesty will be happy to repair to America. But should the passport be withheld, he will willingly proceed to England as a private individual there to enjoy the protection of the laws of your country. His Majesty has dispatched Major General Baron Gorgo to the Prince Regent with a letter, copy of which I have the honor to be close, requesting that you will forward it to one of the ministers, as you may think it necessary to send that general officer that he may have the honor of delivering the letter with which he is charged to the Prince Regent. Sir, your very humble servant, Count Petrach.